Hey everybody, tonight we're debating Does God Exist? And we are starting right now with Stuart's opening statement. Thanks so much for being with us again, Stuart. The floor is all yours. Thanks, James, for having me on. Aaron, great to be with you again. I love this question because so many people come to it with so many different presuppositions. I think as a apologist and pastor, oftentimes somebody will come to me and ask this question, does God exist? And it depends on the person typically. Are you looking for scientific evidence? Are you looking for historical and more intellectual? Oftentimes people will come and will have recently the death of a loved one or be going through something traumatic and they obviously want a more personal counseling type of answer. And for me, I see evidence on both ends for God when it comes to the intellectual as well as more of the personal side of it. To start, I would say science. It's very hard to do science without God existing. And I think that science points actually to a type of evidence for God. The law of gravitation, for example, plays a key role in the God debate. You know, it's Newton's reason for believing in God and Hawking's reason for not believing in God. When Newton discovered the law of gravity, he wrote a book called the Principia Mathematica. And it's the most famous book in the history of science to this day, expressing in it a desire that a thinking person might come through reading it to believing in God. So when Newton discovers the law of gravity, he says, wow, what a fascinating God that he did it this way. And an intelligent designer through our type of creativity that he gives us, the creator, we can learn about the universe. So Einstein talked about how the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. Thus, I would say it's more likely that there's a designer rather than no designer. So there's obviously a world, really a worldview dimension to all this too. You, you know, if you were to tell me, put my atheist hat on and to write an account of the origin of life, I'll obviously come up with an evolutionary theory because that's the only possibility allowed by the naturalistic worldview. And so that must be taken into consideration as well in the scientific question when it comes to God. There's obviously other kinds of sciences, but I believe historical scientific reasoning, which is all about abduction, referring back to causal origins is key. I mean, you go into a museum, for example, and you see the Rosetta Stone and someone asks, wow, how did these inscriptions come about? You try and use methodological naturalism, we may only infer materialistic causes then, whatever the evidence, the scientists would miss the obvious explanation. And this was that it was produced by scribes, intelligent agents, it's language. You can't get that from reductionism. Thus, I would say it makes way more sense, an immaterial, not a material God who speaks through language, who speaks through intelligence to us. So if you go naturalistic route, you're going to miss so much. In, in my mind, oftentimes people, an atheist will say, well, you close your mind to outside evidence for different modes of thought when you are a Christian. But I would say it's, it, it, look at that example right there in terms of language, in terms of the historical type of evidence and how methodological naturalism actually imprisons you in that instance, and I think many others. So the universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. Who said that? Dawkins. So he frames the issue well, I think. And the question though, is he right? And he makes a testable assertion about his materialistic philosophy. And last summer I got to hear Dawkins was knocked sideways by this. He said, you know, digital information processing systems, the cell, the complexity of the cell. He was shocked by the further intricate complexity that he sees in fine tuning and the laws of physics. So we shouldn't expect a beginning to the universe from a materialistic point of view. We certainly shouldn't have expected to find the intricate nanotechnology, information technology that's evident in the living cell. So science for me bleeds right into design, obviously connected. And I'm getting here all at there needs to be a designer. It makes way more sense. That's one of my clear, hopefully clear arguments. So oftentimes people will go with verificationism. They'll say, no, you need science to prove something. Well, how do you prove that line right there? That's not a scientific point. You can't prove that point, it's philosophical. So I don't believe in verificationism. Uh, I think the subtraction theory is spot on in terms of it's not just reason and faith pitted against each other, science and faith or belief pitted against each other, no. 
And I think one of the ways, like obviously this does not prove it, but one of the ways you, we think about this is simply, you know, the last, uh, you count up all the Nobel laureates between 1901 and 2000 and over 60% were Christians. If it was an absurd debate over this type of verificationism and subtraction theory, which is science and faith pitted against each other, then why in the world would there, there be so many Nobel laureates just in those 99 years who were Christians? So I also like, I think, you know, clearly Robert Jastrow, when he says, for scientists who have lived by his faith and the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak as he pulls himself over the final rock. He is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. So science can only get you so far. And I think for me, it goes back to the Hebrew scriptures. In the beginning, it took scientists till the 60s to start to understand that, wow, in the beginning, Genesis actually had it right. So the Bible, theologians have typically come first. But I affirm science in every kind of way. I think actually we are called, Christian or not, to be scientific. Quantum cosmology suggests you know, either a kind of magic where human math creates a universe or mathematical Platonism. I don't believe, again, with this design teleological argument, I don't believe that math just creates itself. I don't believe from kind of more of the Platonistic understanding of things that there's just math out there in some kind of hanging, floating way, like, like obviously Plato talked about in his moralism as well. No, there's a, there's a personal agent behind math. There's a, there's a mind clearly behind math, these mathematical laws that we are exposed to and can actually ascertain ourselves the truth behind them. The Pythagorean theorem, for example, did not just exist and we created it supposedly. No, there are mathematical laws behind it. And I think it makes way more sense that there was a designer, a creative agent, a mind that actually put those there rather than simply they just creating themselves or from a, a Plato understanding of things that they just poofed, all of a sudden were there. So for me, my next point would be reason and logic. Um, I think obviously, you know, many things that aren't material that we know exist one being the law of logic or love, but the laws of logic exist independent of human minds. Suppose there are no human minds on earth, just a rock. If I say there are no human minds on earth, would that statement still be true? Yes. So the laws of logic exist independent of human minds. We don't have our own private ideas of the laws of logic. If we did, then we couldn't communicate. Trafficking in immaterial reality to even talk to one another that's, there's a type of immaterial reality there. Our minds use that as a bridge to other minds. We didn't create that bridge. That bridge is what we mean by God's nature. If there were no material, if there, were, if there was really no immaterial God, excuse me, if there still was a level of conversation, a level of clear reasoning capabilities within us, but then also without us that would still exist without us. So logic, math, why we have a sensible world that's orderly expressions or effects of the order God is needed for science. Without an orderly universe, there'd be no way we could even do science, no way we could even begin to reason, to live in a rational type of worldview even. Next would be morality and ethics. Moral obligation, I think is clear. I think there's a mind outside of it all where we have both values and duties, values being why in the world is somebody actually significant? Why do they have value? And then obligations, why should I, why ought I to do something? I recently was approached by, on a college campus, a group of 15 students just kind of out of nowhere. And they tried to corner me on value when it comes to morality and obligation. And we got to talk and eventually I asked them the question, well, why is why are humans valuable? And they said, well, it's because we give ourselves value. And I said, well, what about a 13-year-old? If a 13-year-old desires, because they have no value and they're severely depressed, why not just euthanize them or allow them to be euthanized? And they said, yeah, that's fine. One said, well, they probably killed themselves anyway, so, so it'd be fine. And I think what these atheists were espousing was tremendously, they were, they were trepidatious, let's just say, about their statements. And they started to rescind them all, just about every single one of them did after about 15, 20 minutes of talking. 
but it shows the risk in terms of if there's no objective value to a human life, what could and most likely will occur. Next would be understanding the human rights connected to this morality, to these ethics. You know, I, I think Hume's approach to the mind, that moral reasoning is often a servant of moral emotions alone. 30 seconds left. That's, that's unnerving to me. And I think for me, again, you look at ethics, you look at morality, you look at human rights and how we're progressing as humanity. I look no further than Steven Pinker, famous atheist, who talked about, biblically speaking, all of these languages of there's an arc of the universe that we're trying to get to, whether it's capital punishment or sexism, racism, we're trying to conform to this arc. And so as an atheist, he still even has to use biblical language in order to talk about a type of moral obligation, a type of moral inference point for all of us to look at. Thank you very much for that opening, Stuart. And I want to let you know, folks, if it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, we are a neutral platform hosting debates on science, religion, and politics here at Modern Day Debate. I'm your host, James, and want to let you know, we are absolutely thrilled, as you can see at the bottom right of your screen, Matt Delahunty and Posh, the Christian debater, will be debating Christianity on trial later this month. It's going to be a big one. You don't want to miss it. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, because you have a lot more debates coming up in the future. With that, we're going to kick it over to Aaron for his opening. Thanks so much for being with us again, Aaron. The floor is all yours. Thank you, and thank you, Stuart, for your uneducated opinions. Uh, your presentation is nostalgic. It's like a review of the long-lost arguments that were refuted in our youth or long before then, but they keep on playing on your favorite station. If God was real, we wouldn't need faith. We wouldn't have to pretend. There would be some way to know that, but not only is there no physical or logical evidence and no way to ascertain whether there's a God or not, we also can't test our knowledge of that. Yet, we've got millions of believers in myriad gods or different versions of God and so forth, All you know, many of them pretending as if they know which God that is, and many of them pretending that they have a personal relationship with Krishna, with Bast, with Jesus, or Zenu, whoever they want to make up. And, and, and it works the same way for everybody, because faith is deceptive in all religions. And then there was a number of other things that in these nostalgic arguments that Stuart brought up. I mean, not only is there... Um, no evidence for a designer because he went into the creationist argument. We actually have plenty of evidence against the designer, and we have all the proof necessary for evolution. Uh, he has a very strange idea about what natural laws are, uh, and like like math, for example. I mean, if a thing is going to exist, it has to have properties. However, it comes to exist, it could be eternal and just always existed, in which case it'll have properties. Or if it comes into existence through some process, then it'll still have properties. And he is saying that whatever those properties are cannot exist unless his favorite magic imaginary friend wished those properties to be. So that two items together cannot equate to two items. And that if you take away one and have only one left, that's only because... Allah wills it. So that makes no damn sense. And then science does not point to anti-science, which is all religion is. I mean, everything about science versus religion is completely opposite. I saw somebody uh, just today posted a, a, a counter to the statement of faith that is posted by the Institute for Creation Research, you know, where all of the different creationist organizations post their, their uh, written uh, attestation that they will adhere to the Bible and will never admit when they're wrong, that, that they cannot even consider and it doesn't matter what the truth is. No amount of proof will ever prove them wrong because they're not allowed. Faith means never admitting when you're always wrong. But the the counter proposal from that, which is made by scientific communities, is that because the truth matters so much, we will have to bow to whatever the facts are, whatever the truth indicates, regardless what we might rather believe. So we have one position that is based entirely on lies and another one that is only pursuing the truth. And uh, the entirety of lies thing means, you know, faith, which is the most dishonest position it is possible to have. Uh, methodological naturalism means that we can't just give up on finding the real answer. We can't close our minds to the reality and say, I don't know, therefore magic must have been a god done it. 
because that's not the real explanation. He thinks it's the obvious explanation, but no, that's not even a possible explanation. It's not an it, it's not an explanation at all. Even if even if it were true that God done it, but that God don't show nothing and doesn't talk to anybody really, or talks to everybody using secret voices and assumed names and so forth, so that nobody knows what the hell he's really saying, then it still isn't an explanation by any means. Uh, religious culture inculcates from childhood, condemning people against skepticism throughout their adulthood, uh, damning people very seriously and very literally, both in this world and the next as they grow up. I mean, you will be ostracized from your communities in many cases. So if you talk about Nobel laureates, you know, in the last hundred years when they grew up, you know, in the in a century earlier or 50 years ago, where they were already getting their award, what have you, they, of course, were raised in a Christian dominated society, where fortunately we're we're not going to be that way much longer. Uh, Christianity is in a general state of decline with good reason. Already the scientific community is at at least half, or I think the majority now of science scientists in all fields uh, have now like walked away from God. I, interestingly, there was a poll that I think a third of scientists still believe in God. Uh, and there was a, some other number that said they did, didn't believe in God, but that they believed in a higher power, which I thought was interesting because they don't know what, what are they, they pantheists or whatever. Um, but it still means that the majority of, of scientists are not believers. Uh, the, the more educated people are, the less likely they are to believe. Certainly the most on, the more honorable or the most uh, honest that they are. Well, then they're 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 not going to be stating things as fact that are not evidently true. My favorite quote from Abraham Lincoln is, "He who makes an assertion without knowing whether it is true or false is guilty of falsehood, and the accidental truth of his assertion does not justify or excuse him." That's what religion is. It is dishonest to assert baseless speculation as if it was a matter of fact. Yet that's what all religions do, and and faith is just a matter of pretending to know things you don't know. So if you couldn't, you know, if this is why the ninth commandment talks about you don't you don't make a, you don't bear false witness against your neighbor, which is taken to be the, against your fellow Jew, because they were talking to a Jewish community. It was all supposed to be Jewish people. You, according to the, the commandments in Exodus twenty and so on, uh, you are not supposed to charge interest on loans to other Jews, just like you're not supposed to, you know, bear fa false witness against other Jews. But there was nothing in there against lying, because if they couldn't lie, they couldn't have a religion, could they? So now, as far as the morality argument, which is the the weakest, the most transparently wet tissue paper of all of Christianity, especially, is the is this strange and completely baseless notion that somehow we get our morality from God, when actually we get our morality from society. I mean, just hands down. I mean, the people that that are selfish and and that are only self centered and apathetic, well, these are not not the people that anyone else turns to or gives support to. It's the people that we know that we can trust that have that actually show empathy for their family, friends, and fellows who stand by their word and rel are reliable. Those are the ones that find mates. Those are the ones that over time reproduce better. Those are the ones that are selected for where these apathetic, selfish types eventually will be found out for the frauds that they are, and and they tend to be removed from society, either being banished, or imprisoned, or killed. That's where we get our morality from. We certainly do not get it. From the Christian God, which doesn't even talk about morality. He doesn't care whether you're a good or bad person because all sins may be forgiven if you but believe. But if you don't believe, then it doesn't matter how good you are because the only sin that will not be forgiven is the sin of disbelief. Thus, it doesn't matter if you're a good or bad person. Morality is completely irrelevant. Blind credulity is the only criteria for salvation. You just believe what the guys in the robes tell you to believe and pay them their tithe and give them all of your children time alone with them some secret place and just you give your money give your labor so you know, so that you have all the little poor houses around the great big palace that the that the clergy get to live in and so they get to assume political power they get to assume financial power they get to be treated as if they're wise <laughs> when basically even if you have a thd what, what is that you, you have a doctorate in mother goose that's it. These people are, do not possess wisdom. They're they're not better than anyone else. They're not, certainly not smarter or wiser. They just have less ethics than everyone else. And that's pretty much it. And I know you gave me 
10 minutes to go on in my opening statement, but I just wrote a handful of counter arguments to Stewart's and I don't know if I can keep talking that long. You got it. Thank you very much for that opening as well, Aaron. We are going to kick it into the open dialogue, but one quick housekeeping type thing before we do, as you can see at the bottom right of your screen right now, Modern Day Debate is expanding onto TikTok. The reason this is important is because once we get to 1,000 followers there, we will be able to live stream debates just like this one on TikTok as well, meaning more people will be exposed to these debates, which is a huge goal for us on Modern Day Debate is we want to provide a neutral platform. So if you are behind that idea of a neutral platform like Modern Day Debate, please do click that TikTok link in the top of the description box. In fact, I'll actually pin that same TikTok link for Modern Day Debate at the top of the chat. If you follow us there, that really does help a lot as we are excited to unlock that feature of being able to live stream our debates there as well at the same time as we stream them on YouTube. So with that, we're going to kick it into open dialogue. Thank you very much, Aaron and Stuart. The floor is all yours. Where would all you right. like to start, Stu? <laughs> Where I agree with you. Okay. I agree with you on priests aren't smarter or wiser. They're often just less ethical. I'd say oft. I don't know if you said often. I'll say often. I think we could we could probably prove that one in many ways. I agree with you on smacking the creationists, the young earthers. I'd agree with you a lot on that. The well, dogmatism. I, them. I encounter many of them in, in both career paths of mine. And the dogmatism, I, I mean, you talk about one of the number one ways to decrease evangelism and potential intellectual evidence behind a worldview you just throw some young earthers out there i feel bad saying this because hey is it ham a few of the the, the son and father reached out well, that, and, that, and I, it's no disrespect to them there what's that hovind hovind that's it it's no disrespect to them because I, I think they're fantastic wait well wait, we, you you just you said no disrespect to them we can't be talking about the same people <laughs> <laughs> know them well enough we text sometimes he has he has my number i just i i think the whole dogmatic piece you're right with and you know i just have a problem with people who lie for a living and know it and it doesn't matter how often or how how solidly you prove that they're lying they're still going to keep telling that lie well if you're making money doing it you may as well not a justification (laughs) i'm yeah exactly Fully agree. So next one I agree with you on. Well, it's interesting you talked about atheists on a, on a whole are more intelligent than Christians. The studies I've seen, it's pretty neck and neck. Atheists may have a hair on Christians, but Anglicans are the smartest. They're smarter than every other denomination, Christian, and they're smarter than atheists as well. I don't well, know I what's deal with creationists, that. so I wouldn't know what a smart Christian looks like. <laughs> and that's why I'm pleased that you haven't been straw manning me. I think you know where I Thank you for saying that because there are people in the chat, and I see this a lot, who accuse me of straw manning, even though I've never used a straw man in my life. And when called on it, on that accusation, those who make that accusation can never produce a single example. Yeah, our previous discussions, I think you did a good job saying, no, I I can just tell you're you're not one one of that type, at least. And if I were to flirt with that type of theology or historicity, of the world. Look, I, I have no problem with flirting with it, but I think it's the dogmatic style that I see in people, that heavy, opinionated way. Where So, for example, one guy who left our church, who is a strong, let's just say, young earther, he said, we're not taking the Bible seriously at all. That's actually the first thing you're supposed to start with, is the age of the earth. So, anyway, not to belabor that point, I, I'd agree with you. I, I think I think that those were the main points I'd agree with you on. I, I think there are many, I'd agree with you too, many, many pretend to know God. I think that's absolutely clear. We have that in our country and that's that's only growing. Uh, I think Jesus talked about that with the Pharisees and babbling on the street corners and the type of prayers that they were making. Uh, so I fully agree with that. There's a video uh, that I saw that I, I quite liked was Republican Jesus, or maybe it was called GOP Jesus. 
and it shows how Jesus starts to say the things you would expect Jesus to say from the Bible, but instead he uses the GOP talking point, which is exactly opposite of everything that Jesus taught, like slogan after slogan after slogan. You know, you, uh, it, it's, it's a it's hilarious video. I'm not going to quote the whole thing, but anybody should go look and look that up. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's too often is those two are too frequently connected. Um, question for you on the moral argument. So if there is no God and perhaps you don't think the Christian worldview. It, it doesn't matter if, it, if there is no God or if there is a God, you can still the same, the same question because the Christian God does not inspire or guide or direct morality like practically at all. I mean, if you might find a passage that implies that you should do good works, but then it also says that you're supposed to believe on faith and that's it. And that it doesn't, and there's no way for a good person who doesn't believe to get into heaven. That's that's just it. But it's possible for an evil person who does believe they can get into heaven all day. All right, leave God out of it then. Let's just write up, let's write up a, and we'll call it a contract or, or we'll call it a strategy on how to make society better. Okay. You bring the atheistic naturalistic worldview, which is some of it. I think you'd agree is driven by strong eating the weak. Some of it, not I'm all sorry, of it. What? Some of it is driven through evolution, strong eating the weak, and you get some of your morality. Where did you get those two put together? What atheism and evolution and naturalism, and and, and this thing about the strong eating the weak. Oh, evolution. Yeah, but, but that's not remotely evolution, and I can't believe that you've never been corrected on such an egregious error. Okay, hold on. Come back and correct me in a second. Let me just finish. Herbert this. Spencer was an economist who misrepresented, because Darwin's theory was all the rage, everybody appropriated it in the early 19th century for their own needs. A whole lot of racists appropriated it, although, ironically, not Hitler, not Mao, not Stalin, but a lot of other people appropriated it for their own ends, including racism and classism heavily. So Herbert Spencer wanted the rich to be better than the poor, and he's the one that came up with that, the the strong survive, the it, the kind of thing about, you know, the, the, the strong eating the weak. So it was his classism that Darwin actually argued against. Good. Okay, so that, so I, are you going to take a humanistic point of view when it comes to how we really make society better? Because you said it. Uh, what I, I generally do, but uh, I, I, a couple of years back, I got I was impressed with the Satanic Temple and how they were how they were able to um, the, the type of defense that they were lobbying against my state of you know, Texas, for example, uh, and and they were they were doing defenses of the First Amendment more effectively than a lot of atheist organizations could. Like when somebody wanted to put up the Ten Commandments in Alabama or Florida or Oklahoma. And the atheists come up and want to put up, well, let's put up our, our monument too. Well, nobody cared because we, what's what's a dedication to astronomy or Carl Sagan or whatever? Who gives a crap about that, right? They don't see that as a religious position so because it's not. So th there's no point. They don't even get the point of what that was for. But when the Satanic Temple comes up and says, well, let us put our Baphomet statue up because we have to be open to all religions. Well, now suddenly Christians wake up to the fact that, but, 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 but we're supposed to be a secular country. Oh yeah. Funny how you don't realize that until another religion steps up. You're open to putting out faith-based initiatives for Christian schools, but as soon as a Muslim school says they want the same thing, oh, well, oh no, we're, 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 we're supposed to be secular. Right. That's what the satanic temple is for. And exploring the Satanic Temple, I found there there are seven tenets, which I think are are far better than the Ten Commandments, and I agree with those. And so I I decided to join their organization specifically to endorse their support of the First Amendment because I'm on the board of directors of American Atheists. Just to redirect First a Amendment defense is what my organization is all about, and I see the Satanic Temple as strong allies in that. So Just to get us back to the uh, good old debate on does God exist, I want to. Go ahead, Stuart. I think you were attempting to set up a, some sort of moral argument. Yeah, just on the heels of the moral argument, I, I, th I think a big part, obviously, of digging through whether God exists is the experiential side and the evidential. And, and I think it's it's experiential and evidential to ask the question, why morally be good? And from an atheistic perspective, I'd want Aaron 
to try and give me the best sell he can from an atheistic perspective on why I should say live for altruism, human rights, why I should sacrifice my own personal pleasures to go on this missions trip that's an atheistic secular missions trip or you know from or from a christian perspective why would i do those kinds of things and which one makes more sense if, if you were i understand that if you're christian then somehow you have the false idea that you're earning brownie points from your god and so the only reason you're doing something good is not for the benefit of that other person, but to appease this the indomitable despot that you imagine is watching every movement you make and who will come down on you badly if you don't do exactly what you're told. Of course, that doesn't explain the prison population, does it? It doesn't explain why there are so many people. There's so many people in prison. You know, was it 98% of violent criminals are all deeply religious? And this goes for child molesters too. The more deeply religious they are, the more uh, they had the more and younger victims they tend to have. And the funny thing about that is that all of these religious believers believe that, that God is on their side, that God fully understands why they did whatever they did to whoever they did, because that that sucker deserved it anyway. And and if they could just get the death penalty and get out of this prison sentence, well, then they'd be with God and God would reward them for whatever the fuck they did that God's already forgiven them for. And they're going to use that as a legal defense. God's already forgiven me, so I don't have to go to prison. So all all that bullshit aside. Now, if you're an atheist, as I said, if, you, if, you, if you're a humanist, if you're a Satanist, if, then, you, then you believe in people, you believe in humanity, you believe in, in society. You understand that there's, there's little benefit in being selfish. What the hell you get out of that? Now, there have been philosophical arguments that anything we do good is actually for selfish reasons, that if we go to benefit somebody else, we do get an endorphin rise. If, you, if I go out of my way and sacrifice of myself monetarily or physically or whatever, and I save some other person, however trivially or even temporarily I do, there's still some degree of reward that I feel for having done something for someone. Where if, whereas if you want to do absolutely fuck nothing for somebody and pretend like you did something, just nod your head and said, I'll pray for you and then don't do a damn thing because that's what that means. But rather than literally wishing on a star, if you actually do something to help somebody, then you're actually, you're doing something and it's real and you're getting the, 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 the rush from that. So even if it ultimately fails, you've got the satisfaction in having at least tried. And I'm only talking about the completely selfish perspective. I'm not talking about from the rest of society and how they view you. The person who did something, because ultimately, whether there was a God or not, history will be our judge in either case. It what happens in, in our, it, how we are remembered is is what ultimately matters. Seriously, and even if we're not remembered very long, it doesn't matter. So, I would say that's another piece, though. Just like Steve Jobs talked about when he was an atheist, he was kind of a Buddhist atheist. But then on his deathbed, he said, you know what? I think that all this experience, these relationships that I've accumulated and all the work I've done, it does not feel nor make sense logically to me now in my final couple of years that all that would just totally go away with the click of a mouse. And so, so I don't know if he became a theist or not, but I think he was after something that's kind of similar to what Richard Dawkins was experiencing last summer. Dawkins was more intellectual, I would say, in his, but he's struggling with the cell and the incredible complexity of the cell and how through Behe and others, we're just increasing our knowledge of the- Wait, wait, wait. Behe is increasing our knowledge or stunting it? I think it, he misspoke. It doesn't matter who it is. Here's, a guy, away, here's a guy who makes the bogus argument. He comes up with a handful of- <laughs> I knew, I knew Behe would get you going. <laughs> he, yeah, he brings up a handful of bogus arguments for irreducible complexity, not understanding- that one of the, the things we would look for as a sign of intelligent design would be an efficient simplicity, which such as we do not see anywhere in biochemistry. What we see instead is haphazard compilations of extremely, excessively unnecessary complexity, which is what you expect of blind incidental design. So then he comes up with a handful of arguments for irreducible complexity, and he tried to bring a bunch more that he brought into court. But the, the star witness, Ken, uh, Kenneth Miller, had already refuted all of them before they ever got to court. So B.E. just brought the, the, the last survivors 
for Kenneth Miller to then slaughter in the stand. So yeah, every one of the irreducible complexity arguments has been refuted. All of all of Behe's, I put that that in my book, by the way, the the the, uh, the foundational falsehoods of creationism. If anybody's curious about the list there, so Behe is not in, increasing our knowledge. He's stunting and limiting and reverting and perverting our knowledge. He's he's not increasing it. So even if he, he and the entire intelligent design group. Yeah. Want to go backward? Want to unlearn everything we learn? But the scientific community, Christian or not, they can just be anything. to be sure we're going toward Stuart. Just to be sure yeah. that we're going toward an argument for theism. Yeah, this is a teleological and design argument. So, I, again, I would say the complexity of a cell and how obviously we're increasing in our knowledge of what a cell is. Like Darwin had a floppy wiener, a uh, hot dog wiener, for example of a of a microscope to look at a cell versus what we have now the high tech we have now and there are machines within a cell that he could not see just thought it was a blob basically there are trucks that move back and forth in terms of the amount of information that is moving and so the complexity only increases and this is why i'm surprised that you're so quick to push back against the complexity and the teleological the teleos yeah, because complexity because dawkins towards my position the more complex it is, especially when it doesn't have to be that complex, when it wouldn't be that complex if it was intelligently designed. Yeah, that's an argument against intelligent design. But more importantly, I mean, you can go back to the 19th century. Wait, wait, wait. How would argue complexity... about what they knew then. I can take your best guy today how... and argue would... that he was just as dumb as them. What wait in what world has R and Ra ever lived in where complexity and design is not connected to a designer or a wait, mind? The one I just, just explained to, to you. Something How completely did you not get random that? or accidental. I just explained. If it's incidental, haphazard, then it's not going to be. It's not going to have been worked out. It hasn't been. It hasn't all the problems worked out in advance. The most efficient design written out in advance. No, it's been slowly accumulated constantly changing and so that's what it's when you look at like um things i don't know like uh photosynthesis for example what an unnecessarily convoluted rube goldberg mechanism that is an intelligent designer would not come up with that it may look simplistic when you look at that from the high school level but when you get into the into the higher level college level and look at that again no that's stupid complex as in only stupid could allow it to be that complex. So your no point would be, to be that complex. your point would be there's no ear to, let me just make sure I'm getting it right. There's no ear to irreducible complexity with the cell or with the eye or with and anything. It's just a matter of adaptation and through evolution, you see and other the complexity factors, yeah. only growing through the cell. Yes. That's what you're saying. Yes. So here, importantly, uh, when we're talking about the existence of God, because I know James wants to stay on topic, and I do too. Uh, what, uh, excuse me, I have two big dogs who think it's time to wrestle. I'm on camera. Don't wrestle. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, the thing that people are arguing for, usually, in defense of God, in the Western world at least, uh, is they want their, their sacred scriptures. And we know that's completely bunk. And they want their thing about, uh, they want to pretend that they are best friends with the most powerful being imaginable. We know that's not true either. Uh, and they want to pretend that they're not really going to die. They want to make believe that they're more special than everyone else, that they're holier than everyone else. And so the important things to look at is that we know, for absolutely certain, we know, even evangelical Christians know that Adam and Eve never happened. The Tower of Babel never happened. The Exodus never happened. Moses never existed. We know that most of the stories in the Bible are completely untrue. Anything that is true is only trivial. Not necessarily, not, it's like Indiana Jones in the third movie of his series. You know, he goes to Germany. He meets, uh, he accidentally bumps into Hitler, literally. Uh, we know that there was a Germany. We know that there was a Hitler, but that doesn't mean that there was an Indiana Jones. So there are famous, you know, the, the Bible mentions Ethiopia, the Bible mentions one or two people that actually existed. It doesn't mean that any of the characters or the events actually happened. And a lot of those characters and events 
we're a mishmash of other people. There's absolutely no support for mind-body dualism, period, none. We don't have souls. There's no afterlife. It's not just that there's no evidence of an afterlife. We have significant evidence against an afterlife, against a soul. No mind-body dualism. So the Bible is utter shit, man-made mythology, and that's all. It has no good for anything. Except, you know, it's anthropological interest in literature, perhaps, and ancient customs and traditions and superstitions. But as far as history or science or fact, no, it's toilet paper. And as far as everything that anybody cares about, the afterlife and all like this, the reason that hell was invented was because that will scare the people who spend too much time thinking about heaven because you can't spend a minute thinking about heaven before you find the major flaws in the theology. When I was a little kid, my grandmother told me that in heaven, the streets are made of gold. I'm like, why the hell would... Why would we want streets of gold? Why would I want slick streets? And why why would that matter that the streets are gold? And she and she said, and we'll all live in mansions. I'm like, why would I need a house? Why would I need shelter in heaven? And what good is my mansion compared to everybody else's mansion? Are there people in heaven that have bigger mansions than other people in heaven? It's just a nine nine oh two one oh nightmare where everybody's trying to to keep up with the Joneses forever. What the hell is this about? Why would we need any of that? None of it makes any sense. And so they realized, hey, there are people that are thinking too much about heaven because the the carrot only has so much weight. We need to hit them with the stick. It's got to be the threat of damnation. That'll keep them in line. Unfortunately, that doesn't work either. Because hell is completely inconsistent with God. If there was a God, there wouldn't be a hell. And whether God existed or not, the Bible is still crap. Evolution is still demonstrably real. Either way, God's existence could not change that. So the only important thing that it comes down to, do we have a, do we have a soul and an afterlife? No, clearly not. Does the scripture indicate anything about God? No. Th those were ignorant savages who obviously had no idea what they were talking about at any point ever. And we can look at other scriptures, and none of the other scriptures are any better, because they did. I mean, I, I spent most, when I walked away from Christianity uh, as a young man, I explored a bunch of different religions, and I realized, no, everybody's just making shit up. See, I think the challenge there is Everything that you got, you got to look at the character of Christ. Was Jesus Christ actually a historical figure? Did he claim to be God? You know, are the are the obviously are the Gospels reliable? And then you look at his metaphorical speech, bit, could the, could his metaphorical speech of heaven, for example. Because like your be mom sure got it totally wrong. I, I mean, no, no offense to Mrs. Rob, but to think, think actually in John chapter fourteen when Jesus is talking about you know in my Father's house to be many rooms and I go to prepare a place for you. He's obviously not talking about that, that, you know, 90210 mansion. So you got to leave room for metaphor. And you keep going back to God. I, I want to correct it in the sense of my theology and what I believe the Bible actually says. God Does is not just this power broker. He's Bible not just wrong on every important well, just thing. Just to be sure we give every Stuart a chance. Them. We've we've heard we, we gave you about two minutes or so. I want to give Stuart about the same. This is the God, and, and you said you've never straw man somebody in your entire life, so you better not straw man. I want you to steel man me after this. Your depiction of God is always this kind of kingly figure, and he's a God of just power, and that's it. And we have to kiss his feet, wash his feet, and somehow by groveling enough, maybe we'll get close to him allowing us through the pearly gates. No, okay, that's, that's not what we have because... with the Christian God. The Christian God is... You well, have the Christian God, because you, you said my version of God. Just to be sure. And I, if when you... I believed in God, my God was better than your God. So it, it wasn't the Christian God. Oh, so you're not talking about my God. No, I, I was talking about a better God. <laughs> Get out. So, so my God is based off of, the, the Christian God is based off of the crucifix. About every atheist I debate wants to leave the cross out. Like, wants to leave what the cross is all about. You know, Matt will sometimes talk to me about how it's a barbecue for a weekend, but that's about as far as he'll go. You have really, to encounter Matt, at least... That's really good at this. You actually have to at least talk about what truly is the cross and be honest about it. Okay. Because I haven't met one atheist yet who can honestly describe to me 
Why did God have to go to the cross? Why did the Roman Empire, and ultimately I believe our Judeo-Christian values came from, historically speaking, the Christian faith, because you have a suffering God dying for us, causing an ability for us now to respond in love self-sacrificially so we aren't getting something, doing something just to please this landlord of ours who we're scared of. No, if it was just a kingly God, then yes, it would be all about self-absorption and fear. I'd fear this God every second of my life. But if it's a God who died on the cross, sacrificed everything to, to show that kind of love for you, obviously you go to him and build a relationship with him in a radically different way than if he was this despot who is terrifying and you have to accumulate enough good works in order to appease him and get into heaven. And you see the difference to begin there? With, Steel man me now. There, were, there are so many false assumptions that your premise is based on. It's like How? everything you think you know about everything you think you know is wrong. Where do we start with that? I mean, the, the idea that, that Matt wouldn't address this, I've personally seen Matt address this. No, he did address it. He, he He's somebody who addresses it. I'm just saying we didn't stay on it. It was the barbecue for a weekend thing. Okay. So God uh, creates us. Yeah. Uh, let's just, let's just, let's be, nobody reads the Bible more literally than an atheist. So. Let's just stay with the literal interpretation, unless you deem it in, uh, uh, unless the, I'm, I'll be happy unless you're a creationist. Yeah, yeah. So we we have the whole fable where where God set the trap, put the bait and the mechanism, everything. He put the serpent in there, intending for the serpent to lie to the woman. He gave the instructions to Adam, and le then left the serpent to deceive the woman, so that they could find out not knowledge of good and evil. Which somehow, <clears throat> knowing good from evil is evil, and Somehow, you can criminally punish people who are not cognizant of their crime, according to God, because God can do whatever he wants, even if it's illegal in modern human society. So God sets the trap, baits the people, and then now what? Now what's going to happen is that God, first of all, he lied in that story where the serpent never, the serpent was the only one who told the truth, by the way. That was, that's important. Uh, and now God has this hell we're supposed to believe. And and if you not if you don't believe, then then God will cast you into hell. Oh, but God doesn't cast us into hell. We cast ourselves. Yeah, fucking bullshit excuses. God made the hell. God said, "Hey, if you don't believe, you're going to hell." So it's it's God that did that. Isaiah forty five five six and seven. If you don't please, quit telling me that I'm straw manning. It's in your fucking fairy tales. So God's going to put us in don't straw man. Not for whether we go to evil, because that can be forgiven. But the only thing that cannot be forgiven, even according to Jesus, is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. I will blaspheme all over the Holy Spirit's face. There we go. So quit telling people, you know, people want to say, well, you could still be saved. No, I can't. Your, your, your whole argument is wasted. You, you're going to have to give me something other than an emotional plea. No, so, yes. so this is no emotional plea. This no. is just the basic center understanding of theology. But getting back to uh, I, all right, so I would like design to, I just want to clarify one thing before yeah, and yeah, I'll yeah. let you continue after this. Sure, sure. You brought up a number of points that would each of them be solid debates on their own. I mean, this topic was just so fantastically general that I couldn't help it, but any one of the other sub of the minor arguments that you brought up would be huge debates on their own. Yeah, and you'd, you'd lose all of them, just to be clear. But those would all be good debates. Agree. No, agree. J just theology. A debate on theology would take about 10 hours. So my next point that we haven't covered yet is reason and logic. So how, from, a, from an atheistic perspective, how do, you, how do you even get close to understanding the immaterial way of dealing with something like reason, reason and logic. Because we talked about math. You just kind of wrote it off as, no, a well, mind didn't create math. And somehow you, you didn't give me the alternative. Did math just create itself? Or was it just hanging there? Okay, so you're going to tell me. So the, the, how do you explain this from a materialistic let's, perspective? Let's address that so I don't get it. Because I get off. I'm seeing the chat. I'm getting all kinds of false accusations. <laughs> Aaron is the Pope. Of it was the, the Satanism. Christian, for example. Uh, yeah. It, <laughs> So you, you say that I just wrote off the math thing. If a thing is going to exist, and it, which means that there's a universe for it to exist in, 
that thing and that universe have to have properties. Mm-hmm. And you're in that we've got a, two scenarios. Let's let, we in, in science we try to weigh two hypotheses against each other. Right? Consider both of them hypothetically. So, universe A has a god in it, wherein one thing plus another thing equals two things. And you take that first thing away, you end up with one thing left. And then in a universe without a God in it, the same thing applies. But you're saying that's not possible. You have to have an imaginary friend to say that two things can be one plus one is two. That it can't be that without the magic imaginary friend. No, I don't think that's realistic. First of all, Let's just pretend he's not my friend in this scenario. He's not my friend at all. He can That's be a not personal... the important part. The important part is the imaginary part. Okay, he can be a personal form <laughs> of a computer, a crazy hybrid. Okay. We can redefine God as long as you attach a mind to it. Because, okay. I mean, follow me on this one. Because the laws of logic, obviously, would you believe they exist independent of human minds? Yes. So, if there are no human minds on Earth, obviously... They still remain, right? So the immaterial reality our minds use, that is a bridge to other minds we would agree on. We didn't create that bridge. That bridge is what we mean, I would say, by this mind, don't call it God, this mind's nature. And if there were no material mind work, if there were no material mind, none of it would exist. It would all break down. Okay. How does the mind that you're talking about exist? And then there's a second question. How does the mind you're talking about do anything? So the mind I'm talking about is a transcendent source. When it comes to morality, that doesn't when it comes answer to math, the question, does it? When it comes to reason and logic, the mind is a type of creative intelligibility that, that would tell me how exist it exists outside of rationale, logic, morality. And this creative agent would create our abilities to actually have a moral understanding, how nature fits in, how we are able to reason with one another, even when that reason logic principle still exists without us. So if you have no God, then it's just pure chaos. There's no intelligibility behind the universe. So when Einstein talks about the only thing that's unintelligible is that the universe is actually intelligible. He's wrestling with, this is insane, and eventually he became a deist because he started to realize that intelligibility is connected way more so to the potential of a mind rather than just some vacuum. Who is this? What what person lost his mind to make such a stupid assumption? Albert Einstein. No, he didn't. He He did say that. And he I'm not misquoting Einstein. I would never again. do such a thing. He said that he was a pantheist, that he didn't believe in a personal God. He didn't believe in a God yes. that answered prayers. He believed sure. that, that re- all of, of human yes. religion was just fanciful nonsense. Agreed. Agreed. He believed in a God, though. Or he had a no, positive he, mind. he literally didn't. He didn't believe in anything that would qualify as a deity. He didn't believe in a pre-planned intelligence to design anything. He did not believe... <laughs> In an immaterial mind that then wished things into being. Because I asked you two questions and you failed to answer either of them. How does this mind that you're talking about exist? And secondly, how does this mind that you allege do anything? How does it exist? Yeah, It's existed throughout time. It's outside of space and time because something needed to create space and time. Okay, so... So if it is so I believe outside a great, of reality, then it does not exist. I mean, how far back do you want me to go? Because we can go back it, to the Big Bang. It, it, we can do, go back it to, doesn't exist. It exists outside of time. So at no time does it exist. No, it's it's outside of space and time. Space and time we are in. It okay. is not. And it's so inter- it, space Saint and time is, is it, uh, through Jesus Christ. So it's your God is Rod Serling. He wrote the script, and we're just... All right, so I answered the first part. What's what's the second question? So your God is Rod Serling. He wrote the script. That's before my time. I don't know who that is. Okay, so so God wrote the script, and we're just all playing out the parts. God wrote the script, and yet he grants us free will at the same time. Which is not possible. But what was the second... Especially when... It's not logically possible. I want to answer your second question, though. 
but you, <laughs> okay. What was your second question? How does it do anything? How does it do anything? How does the mind, how does God do anything? It creates. And now I'm calling it it because I'm changing my definitions of God to try okay, to. So how does it create? Because I said do anything. How does it create? Out of word. Speaks things into being. Abracadabra. And then the word becomes flesh. And so out of actual physical humanity, you have an ability that you see the miraculous, the supernatural playing out in the physical realm. Why don't we ever see By that? By a physical person. What? Why don't we ever see that? About 85% of the world claims never sees that. that. See no, I'm sorry. 100% of the world never sees that. You mean like 15%? I mean, like no percent ever actually sees that. A whole lot of have you been to Haiti? Have you been to Africa? Have you been to Latin America? Have you? I mean, I've been to India. I... I know a whole bunch of people claim but they that... all claim to have experienced the supernatural. Oh yeah, they all claim to have have experienced okay. like like in near death experience. For example, in India, they come back claiming proof of reincarnation, proof that Christianity is false and that Hinduism is true. So, what do you do with that? What do you do with their proof that Christianity is true when when the Hindu has a near death experience and they get to meet their gods? Yeah, I wouldn't in say their it's proof. afterlife, which is then their reincarnation preparation. Right. I wouldn't say it's proof. I wouldn't say it's evidence, and I wouldn't you trust. Wouldn't it say it's evidence whatsoever. You. So your near death experiences are not evidence. Their near death experiences are not evidence. We got nothing here. So we right. have a lot of people that make a bunch of erroneous assumptions and identify gods that don't really exist. Oh, except yours. Yours is the real one. I'm sure. We get morality from society. You said. Yeah. And that's the only place. Okay. I talked about moral obligation and I talked about a moral reference point and I believe that's a mind and it's personal because I think we have personal decisions to make every single morning we wake up, whether we, whether we ought to do something or not do something. And you said we just get it from society. Are you saying that society then objectively or subjectively says whether it's right or wrong? I'm not or are you simply you just saying, up, mommy and daddy, tell us what's right and wrong? I'm not telling you to shut up. I'm just sorry. I, I have a great journey <laughs> that goes off all the damn time. It's so irritating when you're a podcaster. He, he barks at everything. <laughs> hey, I'm glad he's here, though. <laughs> ah, but, but I apologize. I, I'm sometimes not you're even good, able to follow you. I, I sometimes have to jump to the mute button because he goes off. And there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> He's quiet now. Can you please, please repeat what you just said? When you said we get our morality from society, mm -hmm. are you simply talking about we grow up and begin to understand from mommy and daddy and our teachers? Or are you saying no. we get objective morality from our, whether you call it objective or not, from society, and that is right or wrong based off of what society says? Universally. In every society that we live in, because we have multiple, but if you compare them all, I, I, I like to refer to, to Scott Clifton's argument on uh, a treatise on morality, where we all understand that, you know, that, that it would be immoral to unnecessarily cause harm or suffering to another person. We all get that. Now, for people for political biases or religious biases will come up with excuses for how they're justified in doing the thing that they know is immoral in the first place. And that's why they're desperately coming up with excuses to justify that. But if you really are moral, then you're not looking for these excuses and you're not trying to cause this, uh, th this, this pain and suffering on another person anyway. So when you say society, mm -hmm. I, I mean, the global Obviously, society. our All society the has gone astray many times. Right, but I'm not talking about specific societies. I'm talking about all of us, the whole planet, everybody collectively. We all understand. Everybody, everywhere, anytime, any place understands that if you walk up to some little old lady and punch her in the face, that's wrong. Now, you can come up with excuses to justify why you did that. But we all understand everybody, everywhere, every when understands that's wrong. Agreed. And I would say that favors that that definitely point favors on one point of evidence for God that that demonstrates it, how society understands morality from a societal standpoint and not from a God. Thank so, you. And how do you explain audience? 
how do you explain the recent woman who, you know, she's a writer for the Boston Globe, strong atheist. She went down and was trying to help eradicate in a certain tribe honor killings. They thought honor killings were fine. Isn't As that I said, individual groups will find political or religious reasons to justify the evil that they know that they're doing. You and I can both come up with exceptions of how of the excuses that people have written into their dogma to justify the evil that they're doing. We can do so, that all day. But yet again, talking- though, this gets back to the same thing I'm trying to hammer home here with reason, logic, math, and add morality to it. Mm-hmm. Does it make more sense if there's a creative mind no. behind it all? No. Or does it make just total sense that it's completely random? You know, the, all this creativity and beauty came from entropy and also, chaos. Also, no. A blind, it's pitiless not completely random, existence. It's not, just because it wasn't predetermined, because someone didn't have a plan and we're not important, that, that, that the universe wasn't created for us, and will end when we do. It was it, that, that we are the reason the universe exists in our humility. Just because that isn't the case doesn't mean it's completely random because there are processes here that make it not completely random. I would say normally deterministic, but I, you know, some philosopher always wants to redefine things in a, in a damning way. And they say that you know, deterministic, that, 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 uh, that would mean that there's no other way that can happen. But what I'm only talking about that there are processes that guide it to this probability over this other probability, but it's not completely random is the point. So I realize that religious believers have this weird fixation, which I've never understood. I really can't even relate to it at all, where they want there to be a reason for existence and a meaning and purpose for life. And I have to tell you that when I was a little bitty boy and when I I told my grandparents that I didn't believe that Genesis was literally true. Uh, I thought that this is a parable. Obviously, it's a parable. (laughs) I'm explaining to my grandparents how it is a parable. I was eight, and I'm explaining to my grandparents how this is a parable. And my grandfather reacted by saying, well, what is the meaning of life? And that reminds me of when the you know the the, the fortune ter- fortune tellers would uh, throw down the chicken bones or the the tea leaves or the tarot cards, a completely random assortment, and then read what they mean. T- to ask what is the meaning of life is just as meaningless. It's just as stupid a question. It doesn't mean anything. That's just the way it is. But it's not Christians who ask that question. Pew Research came out it's with a study. It's always that been Christians. 90%. That question. 90%. So that's even the little boy in the mud hut over in Haiti. And I'm sorry, that, that but it's always been Christians that you said it's not Christians who ask that question. But to me, everyone has been Christians right up until the last five years or so. And then some Muslims started filtering in. Filtering in. No, I'm talking universally. Okay. I'm sure, I'm sure there's some Hindus out there that make the same argument. No, no, no. 90% of the world is what Pew Research showed. 90% ask those types of metaphysical questions that are transcendent, that are, you know, they want to take part in ecstasy. Is there hope? Do I have a secure sense of health? Will will I last forever? Like, those are all questions that any human (laughs) desires, needs to have met. Even a little child. I'm just just entertaining the idea of when I was eight years old and my grandfather revealing to me that he wants to partake in ecstasy when that wasn't even a thing then. <laughs> Did you partake? <laughs> so, staying on topic if we can. Is this why you're able to drink nine beers in a row and debate me? I'm drinking water right now. No, I know. Last time last time we had our little time together, you, I think you had you told me you had nine and you walked me through every single type I of probably beer you had. did. I probably did, but I only had uh two and they weren't good ones. So <laughs> um I, I still I think the idea of obviously an infinite eternal mind is the architect of both nature we well, talked there's about another flaw. and purpose and the moral purpose of man and the universe that is fulfilling intellectually and experientially oh neither way <laughs> that, is, that is so the opposite because joe Ro- i mean when joe rogan himself came out joe rogan himself i'm kidding joe joe right oh there's an authority you should he recently, he recently, you won't instantly lose all credibility by claiming him 
<laughs> he recently stated, and I think he is an atheist. He said atheists are so depressed because they don't ask these questions because they're too scared to ask these questions. I would and I don't blame him because, Rogan for because all these questions just end in dead ends. If there was a way that we could have a conversation with Joe Rogan where he wouldn't just shut me down on everything that I said, that would be brilliant because I've never heard anything from him that was remotely intelligent. I mean, like, not at all. Nothing I agree with. <laughs> all right. So then tied to morality. You talked about, okay, so the moral obligation supposedly is that oh, every- wait, no, I want, I want to focus on something you just said. Yeah. Because that's important. You said it was intellectually, and, and and I don't remember how else, rewarding this idea of an eternity. No, it's not. No, I didn't say that. That's not what I'm saying. Okay. The pot of gold at the end of the the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is not what I'm saying. I'm saying, well, first off, maybe this helps. What we're talking about right now in debating the existence of God, I think the evidence or lack of evidence that I'm giving. I hope you take 1% away. That can get you to reliability, but it's only experience that gets you to certainty. Oh, no, no, no. Because I've been So there. that's what I'm talking about here. It's, it's not the no, pot I've of- I've been there. I've been the reborn Christian, absolutely certain. I've been there. I was, I was a, after that, I was a neo-pagan occultist for a number of years. I had more evidence as a neo-pagan occultist than I had as a Christian. And eventually, I realized that even that was also a fraud that I was fooling myself. I realized that the problem was faith, that faith is the most dishonest thing there is. It wasn't that honest. priest. What? It wasn't that priest? It wasn't what priest? That priest who was poking you? Or it, it was never a priest poking me. It wasn't the, the church lady who it was, was trying to self I've been in church exactly once as a child. Well, and, uh, you brought was, up the, the you know you brought up the, the priests acting in this sexual kind of way. I was I was checking yeah. to see if that was the case for you. Yeah, I, w- I was brought into a church one time. I was eleven years old. They brought me in because it was my request. I wanted to celebrate the, the we were doing Hall- Easter, and I want to know what is the traditional celebration. Let's just get with all the cultural whatevers and how do we celebrate Easter? And my family told me we do it by going to church. I'm like, really? That's how you celebrate Easter? The fuck? But, you know, they take me to church, and this old codger behind the podium lies to us. And he So it's said, people. Yeah. He people. Said there was a, there people was a pushed you out of the church. It, he said it wasn't objective evidence. Found in a riverbed in Texas, moccasin footprints walking alongside dinosaurs, proving that those were Adam's footprints. And I realized, at 11 years old, that there's no way that if there was moccasin footprints, even if they were walking with dinosaurs, there's no way that you would know that that was Adam's footprints. You can't know that, yet you say that you do know that, and that means you're lying. That's what all religion is, lies. And I said to my grandmother, Grandma, he's lying. And I got slugged in the stomach and dragged out of the church. Because you never question the liar behind the podium. But it's always a liar behind the podium. At our church, we encourage more questioning. Day, I doubt daily, that very much. On a daily, daily yeah, basis. I bet you can't show an example of that. A single one. I bet you can't. You can't give me a sermon that happened, say, last week. Give me the video for it. I will count the lies for you. I will Don't give you. a recording of it. Was there a recording of your church? I will give you. Do you couple, ha- did you get a, a couple- recording? Yes, of your all of our all of our sermons are on YouTube and Facebook Live. Give me that I recording. will give you a recording from a few sermons ago. No, no, no. I quarter, want last week. Once a quarter, at least. You're going to love this. Once a quarter. Give me the, give me the one from last week. We do Q and A. That's all we do in our sanctuary okay. of 700. Give me the sermon. Q and A. You don't you don't do a sermon. We do sermons, but I'm just saying once a quarter. Okay, then give me the sermon that, from last week, and I'll count the lies for you. You want me to preach it to you? <laughs> no, I want you to give me the recording of the sermon in your church last week, and I will count the lies for you. I will gladly send that to you. But your okay. point was that priests and spiritual leaders do not encourage questions at all, and they all shut you down. 
And my point is that our church, it's a fairly large church, and we do Q and A. We we take out sermons and literally just have people ask questions. So one woman recently asked, "Is masturbation okay?" And that was a, a shocker. And yet we we give these opportunities to literally fight back exactly against what pushed you away from believing in God's existence. And that then was why? a man who wouldn't answer your questions. So then it wasn't why? objective intellectual reasoning. Okay. It was largely emotional bias plus plus objective yeah, plus evidential. I'm not saying you didn't think through the evidence. But this was largely emotional too because it was a spiritual leader who was lying and shoving in your face objections to you even asking questions. I mean, I would I would leave the faith too. Okay, but but you say that that your 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 church count, uh, encourages the questions and all of that. And yet, oh, yeah. You brought all of these arguments in favor of intelligent design, saying there was scientific evidence of intelligent design, things we know to be false. When did I say there's scientific evidence for intelligent design? You said that science points to a designer. I said that it's almost impossible to do science without a mind lie. behind it. Yeah, it, it, not only is it not impossible to do science without a magic imaginary friend, it's not possible to do science with one. And so my point is, if you want to fight the creationists hard on that, then I'd agree with you. Because they're, not, they're really pushing hard against science. Now, they have scientific reasonings. But I'm no, sorry, the it, point I'm making is... possible to incorporate your God into science. You said you can't do science without it. I'm saying you can't do science with it. And you can't give me an example where you can do science with it. Absolutely, I can. I just talked to you in my opening. I gave endless amounts of examples. I know. But I heard your opening. And I wrote he, my notes based on your opening to now challenge you on how flawed the opening was. You can't use the not. opening as justification of itself. You were wrong then. You're wrong to defend it now. You no. can't use. You can't say that science points to a designer because it clearly does not. Science. There has to be something that gets this whole thing going. When Darwin if wrote was, Origin of the Species, he was not talking about Origin of the Universe. Origin of the Species was specifically things, people inside of space and time. Then your buddy Dawkins came along and said origin meant everything. So you don't need a designer. You don't need a creative mind or mechanism. And then what did Dawkins do? He apologized. He apologized. And he said, based off of spe especially the fine-tuning argument, he might become a deist. He said that last summer. Uh, so no. For you, I would get to that point of understanding, Dar sir, sir, I am fully on board with Darwin. I'm fully on board with evolution. But this whole mm -hmm. idea that it's all just about science and that you don't have to explain any type of origin okay. and making me look silly that I'm saying that everything in our experience, obviously, if there is a big bang, you're going to look for a big banger. If someone's about to bang my door shut, I'm going to look for a big banger. Everything in your experience says that there's something behind it all. Call it God. Call it the spaghetti monster. Whatever you want to call it. Need to call there's it something most likely we know that's not what it is. there. That, and in that instance, you're right. I cannot scientifically prove that one. Absolutely not. Okay. But that's my point. The origin of the species Darwin never meant to even talk about origins of the cosmos, and Dawkins completely twisted it. So every single person in the U.S. now thinks that that was exactly what Darwin was talking about. I don't defend what anybody else allegedly said, so I don't care what Dawkins may or may not have said. He said a few things I don't agree with, so I don't care to you know to defend everything anyone ever said. When they agree with me, then I'll defend it. So you believe in what, an eternal universe? Do you believe in the multiverse? Do you believe- I don't do cosmology. I do evolution. And when people find that out and they find out that I know evolution, then they want to change the subject to cosmology. My first uh, confrontation with uh, a Muslim apologist group, they were arguing with PZ Myers and they were arguing embryology until they realized that he was a developmental biologist. And they're, I'm not even kidding. They, this is exactly what they said it was- a, when, when they said, well, this is his field, they're, they're quote mining somebody. And he says, well, but it's my field too. And they said, oh, you're a developmental biologist? Yes. Oh, well, let's talk about geology then. 
We don't want to talk about the subject you know. We want to talk about the subject you don't know. That's the way the apologists always are. So when they find out that I'm any good at evolution, they want to talk about cosmology because that's completely irrelevant. But what I I'm, not, I'm not doing that, am I? You brought up intelligent design. You tried to defend intelligent design repeatedly in your opening statement. Yeah, let's have that conversation. I there, is no evidence, there is no evidence of an intelligent designer. There is significant, profound evidence against an intelligent designer. And you just we have said, all the proof we need for evolution. You just said you don't even touch it, though. But now you're I saying you're I don't you're touch certain... cosmology. Okay, okay. Well, how am I running from evolution? I said I, I, I said I love evolution. I just told you. Just I said now. I love evolution. I just told you just now you were arguing for intelligent design, which is why can't you have both? literally creationism, which for anybody why, why who can't you have both? Why, why can't you have a designer? I mean, maybe hey, well, maybe you're you maybe you're parsing. Let's go over there. Maybe you're parsing the two in a different way than I am. Okay, let me clarify. ID and intelligent design is literally the exact same thing as creationism. I know they lie about that. They want to say that it's something else. And I'm not that. Just, yeah. But it was proven in court. Intelligent design is creationism. They're exactly the same thing. Creationism is a rejection of evolution specifically and of methodologicalism, excuse me, methodological naturalism by extension. And you have argued against methodological naturalism in your opening statement and for intelligent design, which means that you're a creationist, which means that you object to evolution by definition. I no. Okay, if then you I don't ever know what said these words mean, let me clarify. If I ever said intelligent design, I apologize. I, I yeah, was well, you, talking you, about you argued designer. for irreducible complexity, which is the intelligent design argument meant to promote creationism. And the reason they changed the name to intelligent design was because it was a criminal con criminal conspiracy to get around the law against teaching religion in public schools. So in the 1987 Supreme Court ruling against teaching creationism or teaching religion in public schools, they had a, a textbook called of pandas and people that used to say that, you know, this is, you know, creationism and it gave the definition for what creationism is. And, and then they changed it with a macro command because it's all on computers. They changed it with a macro command to change creationism to intelligent design. So then the word creationism became intelligent design, but with the same exact definition. So that a, a superior intelligent being, a supreme intelligence, created magically all of these things without having evolved. That's what intelligent design is. It is literally creationism. And the irreducible complexity arguments are arguments that these things cannot have existed the way they are. Yeah. They haven't, they can't Adaptation. have come into position nat right. by natural means. They have to have been orchestrated by an intelligence magically. We now know that every one of those arguments are flawed. So I would disagree. Historically, I would agree on what you, you shared there. But no, I think, I think you can absolutely have irreducible complexity and fit that in even to evolutionary theory and being an evolutionist. It's an and argument I, I think against it's a, evolution. So you're saying no, no it, it is against, against it. Evolution fits it's against it, but theory. it's against it in certain at certain times in certain places, like with the eyeball or like with the cell now. But that doesn't mean you just erase all of adaptation, mutations, and evolution. No, I would totally disagree with that. Okay, well, I, I'm a little confused as to how you're 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 advocating for intelligent design and criticizing methodological naturalism. But you say you support evolution. That that you you, you you're contradicting your own definitions. Or you're, I would you're macro micro evolution. I'm talking about. I'm a micro evolutionist in terms what of what is micro evolution. I, I allow for selective adaptation and changes within the environment within species. But I'm not and a random, macro evolutionist in the sense of there is no God, and so there's no room for the immaterial, the transcendent. You have to explain everything materialistically, and that's why I think when it comes to the moral argument, reasoning, rationale, when it comes to things like love, so many things in our experience are immaterial that the naturalistic worldview falls apart because it's so reductionistic and doesn't allow for the immaterial. Okay, Who okay, so we're gonna, we'll talk about that in just a moment. I want to put, put a pin in that. No, I want to dive into that right now. The naturalistic <laughs> position means— Start the debate. Start. We, we don't assume magic. 
We know that we both know there's a natural world. We both accept that there's a natural world. You want to posit that there's also a magic alternative of reality. I don't make that assumption. And because I don't make that assumption, you label me a naturalist and you call mine the belief, not yours. Yours is the belief. You have the belief that there's a magical alternative reality. I don't make that assumption. So you label me the belief and you tell me that I have to defend my belief in you not being correct about your belief. Yes. You have so many belief presuppositions. It's scary. I don't have the presupposition. I don't have any. Fighting for human rights. Fighting for justice. You believe in the virgin birth of the universe. At least I have no, a woman who was a virgin. I don't believe there was a virgin. I don't believe there was a virgin. I have a, a woman. I have a woman who was a virgin. You have nothing that was a virgin. I don't have any. I don't have a birth. Exactly. There are so many things you take by faith. It's scary. Yeah. I don't have a belief at all. You I don't think you have a whole faith. bunch of things. I don't believe. I don't think you have faith. You have endless amounts of beliefs. I don't have beliefs. Why Name did one Matt, thing I believe. Last time Matt and I debated, he said he has endless amounts of beliefs, but does not okay. have am faith. I, am I Matt? You are not Matt, but you I'm getting to the point. notice a slight difference in our hairstyle. <laughs> the, the dogs are a giveaway, too. Yeah, Matt hates dogs. Yeah. So, so I'm so not going to argue Matt's position. No, no, no. There was a reason I brought that up. Me, and you told me. There was a reason. And I just want to point out how many times you interrupted that statement because there's always people in the chat that say that I'm the one interrupting. I realize I do interrupt and I try to curb that. I'm trying to but, catch you guys. <laughs> yeah, that no, was no, a I'm bunch too. of interruptions right there. <laughs> I don't believe any of the things that you just said. And you just admitted to the shifting of the of the burden of proof fallacy. So you're, you're, you have a belief that there's this alternative reality that I don't assume. We both accept that there's a real reality, that we, you know, the one that we know. But you also suggest that there's another one. The burden, is pro- uh, per- the burden of proof is on the one making the positive claims. Why so await your proof and all instead of substantiating your weird assertion, your baseless assertion, you then criticize me for not being able to disprove you because you can't substantiate your position. And you think that's justified. Wait, this, wait, wait. this might be wait, an opportunity. Wait. Well, if you there want are to endless like, amounts. A quick start... pithy response. And then, yeah. Arn, if you want to go or. We got to wrap it up pretty quick. Uh, I, I am so Q&A. tired of the new scientific definitions on morality that atheists are giving. I'm so tired of the different versions of multiverses. I'm so tired of. Did I mention any of, of that? Tunneling what, and so, did any of that have anything to do with what we were just talking? No, no. About? I'm, yes, I'm getting to it. I'm getting to it. I'm getting to it. It just shows how much magical thinking is getting put in place by, on both sides. On both sides, I, I would agree there's a lot of magical thinking that people Excuse espouse. Me, there's no the magical Christian thinking aid. on my side. But I think the whole issue is that, again, you have the burden of proof as well because we're both making claims to knowledge here. I don't we're mind. making claims to I knowledge. I don't mind living up to the burden of proof for anything that I actually hold true. Good. I can do that. You can't. And the things, can't. the things I mentioned when it came to beliefs, you cannot take an empirical hard stance – and test it in a lab that here's why we should live for justice and human rights. Yes, here's it can. how here's how somehow this place popped into existence. Here's why, for I example, I don't believe anything ever. Here's why, into for existence. example, that's one of the beliefs you pretended that I have that I don't have. What? Which one? I don't believe anything ever popped into existence. You do, but I don't you believe, believe it what you forever. do. Do you believe don't it exists forever? For you believing that? If you believe it's eternal, then then I take it back. I believe it's eternal. You believe the universe is eternal. I had an interview with a number of, of cosmologists, including uh, 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 not just Sean Carroll, but also uh, Lawrence Krauss, no, the, the, the author of A Universe from Nothing. He doesn't actually believe the universe came from nothing. So what I've gathered from all of the cosmologists that I've talked to is that even in, and that there are multiple models here, nobody actually knows for certain, you know, what, what the, 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 when you get right down to the, grid of it uh they're very very confident after the first second but prior to that nobody really knows that's what i'm getting i could be wrong about that because i don't do cosmogony i don't cosmogony i don't care i literally don't care whether or how the universe had a beginning i don't certainly don't have a belief about things i don't care about but what i've gotten from cosmogonists is it is even in models that have a singularity that singularity is eternal it does not matter whether or if or how the universe had a beginning. But what I'm hearing is that it didn't. 
this might be a good opportunity. Stuart, I know that you've got another round in the chamber ready to fire back, but I think this is a good opportunity to go to Q&A so we're not here too late tonight because we've already gone a little bit over that open dialogue. So I do want to really, jump. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry. We didn't even get to the meat of that. No, I know. I, I feel the same way. I just want to jump into this because we do have a lot. And also the good thing is, some of these questions definitely match up with what's been discussed, so it'll it'll hopefully give a chance to kind of flesh out some of the stuff that you guys want to go deeper on. Want to say thanks so much for your questions, folks. We're going to move through these fast, and want to remind you that our guests are linked in the description. So if you want to hear more from Aaron, or if you want to hear more from Stuart, you can find their links below in the description box. That includes at the podcast. I don't know if you guys know, all of our debates end up on the Modern Day Debate podcast, which you can find on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, you name it. We're on every podcast app, and you can find Aaron's and Stuart's link in the description box at the podcast episode as well. We're going to jump right into it. Thanks so much for your question. James W. says, after show at Amy Newman's channel, open mic, help us celebrate Arn Ross win over uh, over Stuart. Tell us why, what you think about the debate. Thanks, Stuart, and thanks, James, and thanks, Arn. Thanks very much for that. And, and thank then... you, James, for declaring me the winner so, so early. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Oh, Flamio says, is... Satan, Yahweh's attorney general and prison warden. If so, it makes sense why Yahweh doesn't destroy Satan. Satan is an employee or minion. I don't know if that's sincere, Stuart. I don't know if you want to address it. This one coming in from... You can just interject. Just jump in, Stuart, if you ever feel like it. Otherwise, the trolley ones are the ones I'll just move past for it fast. Jeremiah Gal Galago says, Hey, Stuart, what do you think about... Ra... Arn Ra being a Satanist. I think they just mean Arn Ra. Pretty neutral and yet very enlightened at the same time. Interesting. Franco Trujillo says, Thanks, Arn Ra. Doing good work. Helped me on my journey out of Christianity. This one from Happy Thunder Stewart says, What is the best sandwich? Thanks for that. You guys have a favorite sandwich at Subway or anywhere else? Oh, the, the white Russian. Roast beef. Nice. That's, that's specific. Aaron, you oh. seem like a guy who enjoys a Reuben. Am I right? What do you like for sandwiches? <laughs> I, well, I, I, I am a big fan of pastrami, yes. Ooh. Nice. This one coming in from Thunderstorm says, oh, we got that one. It, let's see. I want to make sure I read these. Guy with the hair says, is Stewart's argument that Darwin had a floppy wiener, therefore God. Just to clarify, I think, Stuart, that came out uh, with the, the pause was in the wrong place to where someone... <laughs> just like when been... I said, just like when I said I thought Aaron got poked. The, 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 yes, it, it, something got lost through the, uh, through the internet here. <laughs> I wanted to cover my face when you asked Aaron if he got poked by a priest in the past. I, but you meant like... A verbal like jab. That's what you yeah, must. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know. Oh gosh, even yeah, my face turns I, red. I, I, I've, I've never, I've, I've never been uh, the, the the victim of any religious um, person. I just that that's never happened to me. I look out for other people. I see how other people have been victims. Mm. Yeah. Same. Yep. I know some. You got it. This one coming in from Hillary D says, our emotional connection can overlook human error and doing. Have you ever looked at Satan or God and tried to think someone made them up and it took flight with fan fiction? Oh, that's for me. I'm not I, sure I if it's rhetorical to. or for, for you. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. I mean, sure. Absolutely. That's why you got to look into your background beliefs, your horizons, and yes, your emotional reasoning, your confirmation biases. You got to sift through all of it and then decide for yourself. But the sociology of knowledge by Peter Berger up at BU clearly talks about how me and Aaron are impacted by those around us in our worldviews way more than we'll ever be able to realize. You got it. This one coming in from Do Appreciate It Bob says, God is misanthropic. Satan is humanistic. Yes, I agree. You want to, if you well, do want I, to address that, I agree that. that Satan is humanistic, and Satanism is just humanism in Gothic outfits. You got it. And this one from, or well, Stuart, I want to give you a chance if you did want to address that because they, 
being misanthropic, if I remember right, that would mean like not for humans, or in other words, kind of opposing of humans. Yeah, Satan. what was the question though? He said, God is misanthropic, but Satan is humanistic. Yeah, is that, is that a question? I would, I would disagree with that. If you agree with that, I, I would disagree with it. But based off of what Aaron just said, I, I'd want to look into it more. That's fascinating. I saw the Super Bowl and how many Satanistic symbols there were on Rihanna and others. And so now I, would, I bet you there wasn't one Satanist involved in that whole production. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's what I was thinking. It's like <laughs> <laughs> this from from Christopher. Custon says, I had to be taught Christianity. Why didn't I have this God belief since my birth, Stuart? Well, I don't believe everybody is instantly given proof that God exists as soon as they're born. No, different people come to believing and building a trusting relationship, not just some mental ascent with God at different stages. For me, it was 10 years old, but then I almost dropped everything my sophomore year of college. And so, no, it, it yeah, I, I wouldn't say everybody is born with a certainty of it. There are many studies out there that show that, or on both ends, I bet Aaron would have his own studies showing whether somebody is actually born with this innate desire to know God. And so, no, you, you could, it, it's up to you. you you've got to decide and based off of your free will, and that's what God has given us. And that's where we have the ability to love or not love and to decide to follow him or not. Yeah, I, I want to add to that. Our ability to love or not love is completely independent of whether we were fooled by that particular lie. But uh, you, you said that we were influenced by other people around us more than we would possibly know. I came to recognize that because I've been in a number of different cultures in my life, and I recognized how those cultures affected me. You do respond to the people around you, whether you're aware of it or not. You, you, you want to be in accordance with you know, your entire circle around you. And I've recognized how that there, there is that influence. Uh, but there was another point I wish I could remember, but I'm having a senior moment now. I should have had it written down in notes. You got it. We can come back to it if you have it. And want to say, Oliver Catwell, thanks so much for sending your super chat question via PayPal. Folks, if you want to send it via PayPal, if you have any sort of malfunction or anything with here on YouTube, you can. Our PayPal is in the description box. And this one coming in from Braden Runel, his mouth. Uh, Braden runs his mouth. Sorry about that. Aaron, if there was a big bang on your door in your room, wouldn't you wonder who or what caused it? If there was anything, I would wonder what caused it. Yeah. You got it. This one from Otangelo Grasshole. Oh. I don't know if this is the real Otangelo. I think this might be the troll. <laughs> There's a troll or two running around posing as Otangelo. Says, Why would Ra you pose as Otangelo? What's the, what would be the point? That's a <laughs> if you're trying to if you, that would be redundant. <laughs> they say Arn Ra have no show have no show why life not irreduce complex. He have not even addressed... Okay, this is definitely a troll account. That, that's there's... definitely a troll. Even Otangelo's not that <laughs> And then, let's see. Okay, I'll just move the next one. Christopher Custis is related to my last question. Why does the theist give verifiable evidence of deities without scripture or holy text? I assume they meant why doesn't the theist do that? I was arguing from authority, and I try not to do that. Even though Romans 2, 14 through 15 does absolutely talk about what I was, I was speaking with Aaron about in terms of the moral and the natural being wedded together perfectly. This I'm having a senior moment, too. This Cambridge professor talked about it in terms of the, crea the creative intelligibility behind nature and morality. And Romans chapter 2, 14 through 15 talks about that. So that, that makes sense of it. But no, I don't I don't use scripture in debates. Yeah, it would, it would take me a minute to look up where the Bhagavad Gita said the same thing at least 600 years earlier. <laughs> you got it. And Michelle Maria, thanks in the chat, says, thousand in the live chat, hit that like button. Thanks for your support, Michelle. And yeah, please do. If you enjoy this debate, it really does mean a lot. For real, folks. This one coming in from Lin Yenchen says, religion only means cyclic or repetitive. 
That is why you can correctly say you religiously verify that your appliances are off before leaving the home. Pigeonhole I, is the path to death of the language. I, I would like to, to jump on that if you don't mind. Sure. I mean, I, I took a, a, a course on the, the comparative history of world religions, and one of the challenges was to define what a religion is. And being that I'm into taxonomy, I, just, I realize that your classification has to apply to all of them. Uh, you can't just make one specific to one and, and exclude everybody by definitional fiat. So, and I, I've applied the same thing to gods in my definition of them. But a religion is a faith-based belief system that posits the notion that a supernatural essence of self somehow survives the death of the physical being to continue on in some other form. Now, my definition does not apply to Satanism, but then the U.S. government doesn't have a definition of religion, and so that's why they recognize Satanism as a, as a religion, and I don't. You got it. This one coming in from, do appreciate it, Christopher Custins strikes again, says, RN, I had the same experience at seven years old. I did it for the candy and not getting in trouble. This one from French, Fran, Franco Truillo says, people really do be having faith since forever. This one from Bubblegum Gun says, when are you going to let me debate Dr. Thompson? I don't know. Email me. This one, Mindy Mild, thanks for your super chat. I didn't see a question attached, but let me know in the live chat as a normal chat if you had one you wanted to attach. Hates stairs. Good to see you again. Says, so Stuart, how do you cherry pick what is wrong and right? Is eating shrimp okay? What about wearing polyester? Is stealing my neighbor's cattle okay? Yeah, it's definitely not cherry picking. It's old covenant versus new covenant, dietary ceremonial laws that were needed back then. If you, yeah, if, if you ate certain things that were unclean, you would get pretty sick. So it actually made quite a bit of sense to do so contextually. Obviously in the New Testament, you do not have that. Today, we do not have that. We have different forms, mechanisms to clean things, for example, but it also pointed in terms of the dietary and ceremonial to more, much more of a pointing to that Jesus Christ could ultimately be the only one who would make us clean by dying on the cross for us. And so the old covenant was shown to be how people were constantly trying to make themselves clean to go into the Holy of Holies, for example, but they constantly fell short. So there's, there's both angles to it. You got it. Thank you very much for your question. Charles Lehner says, Aaron, do you have confidence that the laws of logic that are true today will be true tomorrow as well? And if so, what evidence do you have that it will be the case other than, quote, because that's how it's always been, unquote. How could it possibly not be? You got it. Bubblegum Gun strikes again, says, Arn Ra, would you debate me one-on-one -on, -one on evolution? I don't know if you know this guy, Arn. I suggest no, but... <laughs> but it's I, I've to... never heard of him, but it doesn't matter. I don't think I've ever heard of him, but, I mean, it's not a familiar name. I'm open to having conversations on evolution. I, that's a subject that I do understand, and I'm happy to help any creationist who, if you still believe in creationism, call me. I'll be happy to have a live video conversation with you, and I can help you. You go to this one coming in from. Ryan says, credit where credit is due, Stuart. Your conviction to continue to do debates, despite losing embarrassingly, embarrassingly is impressive. They gave their ribbon you in the old live chat, Stuart. I'm gonna take that one. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's very funny. This, the bank, baby. That was, that was a good one. I'm gonna hold on to that. This one from Lin Yan Chin says, "Evolution is just continuous adaptation to an ever-changing set of circumstances within one's environment. It's a synonym for quote-unquote living. This is a quote-unquote Christian." Why so spastic rather than sapient? Was this question for Stuart or me? I think for Stuart, at least the jab at the end there. But in terms of the beginning part, for you, are and I think you're right, this probably was for you. They say evolution is just continuous adaptation to an ever-changing set of circumstances within one's environment. It's a yeah. synonym for living. Yeah, as long as the circumstances change and as long as it, you know, the life forms change, then yeah. 
You got it. And then, Stuart, you're apparently not sapient enough. You are too spastic for them. Sapient meaning wise. I don't. What, on, under what grounds did you read that one? Were they offering you money? We, even in these cases of the jabs at Stuart, we do read them because we go through all the super chats before we go through the standard questions. So they, 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 did, they offered you money to make that comment? This is a super chat, yes. Okay. That's pretty, that's pretty impressive. I like that. This one from... I'm used to these on, on the basketball court. A little bit of elbowing here, but, but this... keep bringing it, James. This one, I always, you know, that's the thing is if you can take crap well, I, in my opinion, I feel like it can, it can kind of like lift your um, yeah. presence oh, in yeah. a positive way. It's if it's the... creative crap. When it's people get crap. reactive and they... Yeah, that, I guess that's my problem with it. I mean, there's, that was just an insult. I mean, that that would be my issue with it. I, I didn't see much point in that one. You got it. This one coming in from Samir Farsain says, Atheists don't exist. If they can't disprove creation, their best bet is agnosticism. Change... Excuse me. Atheists do exist, and I can prove that have done past tense... And can prove evolution, can disprove creationism, have done past tense. You and I should have a long series of conversations on my channel. You got it. This one coming in from Lin Yen Chin says, The true Christian seeks inner stillness, not noise of insecurity. Let's see. Yeah, this is this guy's <laughs> really coming after you, Stuart. Well, this one coming in. It's more Buddhist than anything. I appreciate it. I, I got to get a name on that guy. <laughs> Atheist Allosaurus says, why does Stuart always laugh and gish gallop like a maniac whenever he loses the arguments? It's it's the uh, the cold brew I'm drinking, actually. Juicy. It's to say temperament. It's, it's a high level, high temperament. Got high blood pressure, too. This you one... know, yeah, yeah, sorry, keep going, James. Go ahead. I want to give you a chance if you'd like. No, no, I was going to ask Arn a question. I'll ask it after. You got it. Atheist, oh, there we go. Charles Lehner says, if the universe were eternal, then the past would be infinite. We live in the present, therefore the past is not infinite. But according to cosmologist Sean Carroll, the past is infinite, and so will the future be. This one from the Muslim apologist says, both, what is your purpose for existence? I'm guessing that's for me. I think they uh for both of you. Oh, this should be good then. Uh to serve God and to serve others. <laughs> the definition of a calling. Wow. Okay, that that sounds so abysmal. So Christianese. Yeah, I mean to 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 be a slave to an indomitable despot. Ooh, what a war. It's like the second part though. The what? second part. The second part of what? What I miss. No, the, it's point one is to serve God. Uh -huh. And when you serve God, you flourish the most as a human being, joyfully, physically. Recent Harvard study came out with that. One came out in 2018, too, that we could go into. And then to serve other people, which is obviously when you're serving others and living for another person and loving, that's when the world is at its best. Okay, so, those so that, two, I think, that's the part I'm in. And you're also in servitude to an indomitable despot. But why are you in that part? Is my, what's a good good reason for I'm, art? I'm, I'm a human like I understand it's a, I understand it's a decent reason that art could probably think. But why? I, because I understand this, there's not a great reward in in uh, being selfish, and self serving. But the the selfish naive though, like we like, evolved well, as a social animal. We need human companionship. Why not be a free rider? Because we care about other people, unless we're why? dysfunctional. Why? That, why? Why would you do that? Because See, I have more of a motive. I just explained I, there's more, that. There's much more of a reason. Now, my reason could be totally fallacious, but there's much more of a reason behind my worldview as to why to serve somebody than yours, which is much more societally based, and supposedly we should just do it. I'm at least serving people that are real. Okay. I'm not, I'm See, not that's making something up and then and trying to to imagine that non sequitur. Maybe after I die, it my my death is not even relevant. We're talking about you know, the if if somebody is in need, and I'm able to help them, 
I can help them, right? And right. so I would do that. Right. And I do. Right. Why, why would you sacrifice, though, is the whole question. Why would you sacrifice your own time, physical well-being, resources? I, mean, I could see you just doing it and just say for my common man. Does that person need help? But is that is that good enough? Like, why would you do that? Does that altruistically person need help? Does the person need help? Yeah. Uh, either way. Is their reason good enough? Does it have to be my reason? Well, if you're going to act, it has to be generated by some type of reason on your part. Yeah, if, if that person has a need and I and I'm able to fill it, you know, without without compromising my own ability to continue. Yeah, I would just say from that worldview, it makes sense to be nice, but not real, but not really nice. And what I mean by I that is a distinction. And I, <laughs> and I also don't get from your perspective. Here's what I mean. What I mean is from your from the naturalistic atheistic perspective even through humanism wh whatever D don't worry about it. just from what you've described i still don't understand why you would serve somebody over in malaysia who's really hurting i know you would because you, you are a good guy I, I've, I've had many conversations with you but why why from your worldview would you sacrifice so much i, I just i can't get there well, we, I would have to know the specifics because, you know, there are, there are some people that are more of their own problem than you can deal with. I've had to walk away from from personal friends that there's only so much that you can do. And when it comes down to the point where all they're doing is lying to you and, and everything you do to help them is just for waste. There's a there's a there's a certain point where you just got to say, hey, um, I can't do this anymore. And you're on your own. I had to do that less than a year ago. I had a friend for decades uh, who was deep in addiction. I knew he wouldn't get help if I didn't take him, if I didn't if I didn't make the arrangements myself, if I didn't drag him physically there myself, if I didn't take him to the pharmacy to get his medication myself and watch him take that. And, and all of that I had to do because I knew he wouldn't do any of it. But I can't force him to take the fucking pills. And then when I found out that he didn't take the pills and he lost another job again for being drunk. I thought, okay, this was the, your sixth time in a year. I, I can't do this anymore. So there are limits. This one coming in from Forte says, is there an argument for not spreading atheism from the view that religion is a byproduct of evolution and as such offers many benefits to the believer in terms of health or whatever, lowered anxiety, uh, lowered depression, they say the Robert Sapolsky argument. I don't argue for spreading atheism. I'm, I'm an advocate of truth against lies. Religion is a pack of lies, so I don't lie. That's, that's it. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question as well. Notion Slave says, atheist worldview, in the atheist worldview, we exist for no reason, no purpose, just a giant energy ball strangling itself. May as well believe we live inside of Barney's butt. Like Barney the dinosaur? I don't understand. What is the fascination? If, 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 you're, not the, if you're not the reason the universe exists, if the universe wasn't created just for you, if you don't have a special purpose then you have to be morose. I, I don't get that. I've met so many Christian believers who really think, and one of them actually said to his own congregation, he admitted that he was completely irrational and he had no justification for believing what he did. But he said, if, if what you do five, if what you do today doesn't ma still matter five billion years from now, then it doesn't matter now. He said, if he couldn't live for absolutely forever, then, if he only had a temporary lifespan and that was it, then he said, then there's no reason to help anybody else. There's no reason to prolong life or to minimize suffering. You just may as well just hurt as many people as you want to. I don't remember. I don't think he said that last part, but he, he did say the other two parts. And I thought, that is the most nihilistic perspective I've ever heard from a guy who's arguing against nihilism. That was Ew. disgusting. If you can't live for you know five billion years, 
then then what you do to help somebody today doesn't matter today that's just wrong every way possible you got it this one coming in from do appreciate your question zero glitch says question for Stuart. since you say both sides have the burden of proof what's enough proof someone can give you that would make you concede your belief in god show me the body of christ well that's uh yeah uh, so if, if if jesus was um as some have suggested either a compilation of different characters into one uh, and that the stories of his crucifixion were confused or conflated with uh, you know, events that happened to other people, or that he wasn't necessarily put in this tomb, but was left to the dogs to tear apart and all like that. Well, then you're never going to see that body, are you? My, my experience has been that when I present this uh, hypothetical situation, that if people had a time machine and an Aramaic translator and they could go back with the TARDIS and go look for Jesus, that... If, if even if they could find him, if they could find his body and see it rot, I've had Christians tell me, and I've got documented evidence for this because it's still available online. They admit that they would still believe it anyway. And I encounter atheists all the time on university campuses who say that they wouldn't, even if it was true, Christianity, that is. And I would say, just to Aaron's point exactly, you're not going to be able to turn up a body now. I would have to see like an ossuary that literally had written out like, hey, this was all just a big hoax. And then I would need <laughs> that connected to other ossuaries with these. I want to clarify friendly. something here. If I have a personal <laughs> religious experience, I've had personal religious experiences as a Christian and as a pagan. And I had them as a pagan after. And the ones I had as a pagan were better than the ones I had as a Christian. But I've learned how deceptive those religious experiences are. So having that personal religious experience means nothing to me. I need objective verification to know that I'm not fooling myself. As a matter of fact, that's the very reason that I'm not still a Christian. When I was a reborn Christian floating around in this euphoric daze for hours, I had the presence of mind to ask a friend of mine who at the, who at the time were just high school kids. But I mean, this guy it later became a Southern Baptist uh, preacher. I said, how do I know that this elation that I'm feeling is really the power of Jesus and it's not, that I'm not just fooling myself some way through a trick of the mind? And he told me, just keep telling yourself it's Jesus until you believe it. Act as if. Wow. The fake it till you make it thing yeah. broke my Christianity in an instant. Yeah. That would break mine too. You got it. Thank you very much for this question coming in from. Amy Newman says, after show, after the debate, another amazing debate, James. Question for Arn and Stuart. What would change your mind that a God does or does not exist? Stuart, we already kind of heard from you, but Arn, any thoughts? Yeah, there's a number of things. Like when we when, when I argue about evolution, I, I show people what we can verify. And when I say something is true, you don't have to take my word for it. You don't have to take anybody's word for it. We can go out in the field and see it yourself. Right? We, we can we can go into the lab and see it yourself. There's so many different ways that I can demonstrate the truth of this thing. But with God, all you've got is one storybook contradicted by all of these other storybooks that talk about different gods. And nobody has any verifiable truth to anything. Nothing that can be objectively verified. We, and if, if there was really was a God, and especially if he was going to be such a bombastic asshole that he would dare to damn somebody to hell forever and ever and ever for not believing in him, then it is his responsibility to make up for this huge mistake of not providing any evidence and, and giving us only only the most untrustworthy liars that to, to convey his message to us and stories that we know are you know, fractured fairy tales and completely false. It's God's fault I don't believe. God needs to know how to fix that. Any I would just say to that, I, I agree with a lot of it, and I oftentimes think that way, but holding in tandem with, if you have a God big enough to get angry at, at, at that angry Small at. Small enough. Then, then you have them. to you have to have room for a God like that to have reasons that you don't know about. If he's if, that if big, God if he's that small big enough, to well, be if he's that, that small, petty. then you don't need those reasons. <laughs> right. 
that, that God is very, very small, very, very insecure, almost as if, as a matter of fact, exactly like there is no God, it's just the clergy trying to sell us a bullshit story and trying to scare us out of questioning them. This one coming in from, do appreciate it, the Grim Skeptic says, Stuart, would you debate the YouTuber King Xerxes? I don't know who that is. Me neither. This is from Jay says, Stuart, do you believe it's possible that the universe could be eternal? Uh, no, I don't think it's, it's eternal. It wouldn't shatter my faith if there was, like, say, like a multiverse, because I still think there would be a creator behind multiverses but that's it aaron aaron help me there though with the eternal perspective tonight it's i hate the cosmology question because it's completely irrelevant to everything i study people creationists argue with me all the time that we are not evolving apes and the argument they always bring up is where did the universe come from that makes absolutely no difference if the universe had a beginning, we're still evolving apes. If the universe is eternal, we're still evolving apes. Can we get back on the topic? But they don't want to. They ultimately they want to defend the, their their fairy tales in the Bible. Why do you go back to cosmology? We know the Bible's fake. Let's look at this. Let's look at all of the different evidence for why the Bible's wrong. But no, they want to go back to the origin because. They want to go back to the, the, the distant past so far back that we're not absolutely certain about everything we know for sure. Then you can, you've got your vanishing gaps where they can call in to God. If you argue about evolution, I'm sorry, I got everything you need. So that's why they push the, the boundaries back. You got it. They also ask, James, are you a Christian? Yup. And they say, Aaron, you rock. This one from the Grim Skeptic says, Stuart... We got that one. Notion Slave says, Atheist Worldview. Oh, we got that one. Let me just reload this puppy. Thank you very much for your question. Fetor Mephitis says, Did you skip my super chat question? Nope. We're just getting to it. Thanks for your patience. This one coming in from, bear with me, folks. We've got to reload the page here. Our guest, Stuart and Aaron are linked in the description box. If you have not already checked out their links, we highly encourage you to. Even if you disagree with them, there's a value in it. In the sense that if you disagree, it's good to at least understand what you're disagreeing with, right? So in other words, if you disagree, hey, you could still learn just to be sure that you're kind of like, okay, I get exactly what they mean. I can strongman them. Uh, what is it? Steelman them, as they say. Eddie, yeah. Eddie Dean says, Aaron Raw, on the topic of helping others, it would help me emotionally if you show us one of those beautiful creatures behind you. I'm looking to get my first snake. Which would you suggest as a starter? That's a fun question. Yeah, it is. I'm sorry. I have the I have a wall of snakes behind me. If anybody's curious, uh, I used to say that it was corn snakes would be the easiest ones, but but I realize it's ball pythons. They're slow. They're easy to take care of. They have very few requirements. So you want to make sure that you maintain the temperature and humidity and all that. But it's really easy. They're sluggish. They're derpish. They don't run away from you like corn babies can. Uh, more importantly, I want to I want to add to something uh, on Stuart here. I have debated a number of people that have been hugely frustrating with me because they lie. It's not just that we have a different opinion. The people I argue with usually openly, overtly lie. And so far, Stuart and I have just had a difference of opinion. And I think I, I still think I can help him, but he hasn't actually lied. That I caught. Thank you for that. I still think I can find lies in his That's sermon not... from last week. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate your authenticity, Aaron. And uh, well, you know, I can't think of a, a, a debate where where somebody hasn't just come out and bald face lied, and I've been able to call him on it. So well, it's, it's Aaron, important to mention. I, I very much appreciate that, and secondly, I, I get from a lot of people that I'm one step away from atheism. So I don't know if that is, uh, if that's connected or not. All right. Well, our, our convention is in April. I'll see you there. <laughs> I was waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Dubai. <laughs> this one from Samir Farsane says, not true, Aaron. Would you like a clip of Lawrence Krauss himself insisting, yeah, 
nothing, no space, no time, no matter, not even quantum fluctuations. He, he yeah, not even quantum fluctuations. No, that's not. I've been to. I've seen his talk a number of times, and I've talked to him about this a number of times. But I don't remember him ever saying that there was not even qu quantum fluctuations because his position depended on that. Hmm. This one coming in from Franco Truillo strikes again, says, Aaron, would you like heaven if, it, if you weren't stuck there for eternity? So like a temporary visit. When I was 12, I remember praying to God to, to spare me that. Just let me die like we're supposed to don't make me have to sit through an eternity you got it this one oh but i think they were saying like they said let's say you could, could just be a temporary uh visit instead so like there isn't anything remotely appealing about heaven at all i want nothing to do with it what if stewart's there oh <laughs> <it up> a <laughs> <little>. <laughs> this... <laughs> This one from Harrison Bridges says, <clears throat> Aaron, please accept my friend request on Facebook. You got a fan out there. And then Kent McLeod Jr. says, For Aaron, please explain in detail how and why Christianity was legalized under Constantine and spread during his reign. Constantine found the, the strategic value in the emerging cult of Christianity. And whereas uh, it had been under the Romans, it was illegal to be a Christian up to a certain point. When Constantine adopted that, within 70 years, it became illegal to be anything other than a Christian. You got it. And this one coming in from, do appreciate it, Hill Hugger. says, for Stuart, how did words and sound exist before our universe did? And how do you know this? Uh, I said without human beings, rational logic would exist. And I was saying that most people would buy into that type of reasoning because you don't just get rationality and reason just from us talking. We think we get it from an outside source, most likely. You got it. Phaetor Mephitis, thank you for your... Is that how you say it? Phaeton uh, Mephitis says, do either debaters believe that what we understand or see as our existence could be the product of an ancient higher life form? Maybe like a simulation, if there were aliens from a billion years ago. I don't know what a ago. higher life form is, but I'm going to say no. Agreed. You got it. This one coming in from, you guys agree. All right. This one from Jay says, Stuart... Do you believe it's possible that the universe could be eternal? Oh, I think I asked that. Forgive me. I think I asked yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. This one from the Grim Skeptics. We got that one. This one from Notion Slave says, Atheists. We got that one. Eddie Dean. Thanks for your question. Says, got that one as well. Harrison Bridges says, Stewart asked why he would take the time out of his day to help someone else. Sounds very self-serving. P.S. We got that one. Did we get that one? Sorry, guys. I, I've got that, like, my, my eyes are jumping uh, from line to line. Did you hear it, Stuart? What about the self-serving? Oh, yeah. Let me just... Two moments. I'm loading this puppy up. They said... Uh, I think that's a troll chat in the comments, so ignore that, folks. This one from... They said Stuart asked why he would take the time out of his day to help someone else. Sounds very self-serving. Oh, I think that you it might have been when you were saying like on a, assuming a secular like a, an atheist naturalist position. I think as rhetorically you were saying like so why should I help someone? You were asking that question to Aaron. And I think that they were meaning that you personally were saying like on your own worldview you don't like helping people. Does that make sense? <laughs> no. If, you, no, if my... you really are selfish and you really don't want to help people, buy a sports car or a motorcycle and have that as be your, your only transport. If you make the mistake of doing as I did and buy a truck, you're going to help people move a lot. 
that's that's the worst <laughs> <laughs> this this one from charles laner says why it matters everything that begins to exist has a cause the universe began to exist therefore the universe has a cause like that's this one got but addressed the universe charles didn't begin to exist yep rn is of the position that it's eternal daniel Teamster says mind learning evolution from Dr. Hovind. Okay. <laughs> um, Convicted fraud Hovind, not doctor. They say, they say Aaron raw question mark. I think they mean like, what are your thoughts on this? I think we just heard them. Any other thoughts? Yep. Mind. I don't know what they mean by mind learning evolution from Dr. Hovind. I know who Dr. Hovind supposed to be, but I, I don't want, I don't know what they mean. Stuart, learning. isn't that a blissful thing? James doesn't know who Dr. Hovind is supposed to be. What kind I'm of a sheltered fuck. world does he oh, live in? Oh, no, no, I know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> this, I was saying, I don't understand oh, the... Hovind's not coming back on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of... But anyway, this one from Jay says, Aaron, when you believed in God, did you ever believe he talked to you? If so, looking back now, who was talking to you? Okay, well, I, I never believed that God talked to me. I asked one question. I, in my prayer, I asked one question of God that I can, I can honestly say is answered. And it was the prayer I alluded to earlier. I, I, I at challenged him to, because I read the Bible for the first time. Uh, well, not the whole thing. I, I, I didn't get very far into it before I threw it across the room and discussed, because it obviously wasn't the words of a supreme being. It clearly wasn't a God of wisdom and love and all of that. I, I and I in the privacy of my own room, just like it says in Matthew, I prayed to God to justify the horror and atrocity and ignorance and stupidity that was attributed to Him in the Bible, and that if He would not, do, if if He couldn't do that, then explain how the Bible got Him all wrong, and if He couldn't do either one, then He could not have my soul. I was ready to damn myself to hell rather than be in the presence of and have to be subservient to an evil despot. And I can honestly say that that prayer was answered because the entirety of my life experience after that has proven again and again and again almost daily that the Bible is a load of crap, that it got everything wrong, including God, if there was one. You got it? This one from? Okay, Lieutenant Gregory Stevens, I think that's the troll chat let me load another one <laughs> let's just give you Stuart's email if you want to talk this one I want to say remind you folks that our guests are linked to the description Samir Farsane says Aaron have you considered what if it's not God's fault but rather what if it's humans fault for wasting our lives trying to disprove his existence instead of seeking him I don't know anybody who tries to disprove God's existence again this shifting the burden of proof you're making an assertion that there's a thing. I say, okay, show me. Well, I can't show you. you got to prove there's not. No, that's not how this works. This one from Eddie Dean says, If all knowledge of science and religion were to be wiped off the earth in 2,000 years, the same science would emerge, but different religions. Do you both agree? I do. Read the beginning of that question again. Two thousand think, years, science would. I think they're saying like if all that we, all sort of documentation and even like internal knowledge or beliefs, were wiped away regarding science and religion, they, and then like let's say we'd like started from a clean slate, and like just restarted humanity with no belief or knowledge about these things. 2,000 years later, the same science would emerge. In other words, the same mainstream theories, like let's say the Big Bang or whatever it might be, they say, but different religions would take the place of, for example, these kind of the old religions of Christianity, Hinduism, etc. Yep. I mean, it's, it's impossible to say, but I doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> it's not impossible to say. Yeah, it, there there would definitely be different religions, but the same science. Well, there would be more religions. Yeah, but they'd be new ones. They wouldn't be the old ones. It depends if what would history? Would history have been totally different? 
Yeah, if history no, would have. We're, we're, we're talking about if all knowledge of history was wiped, somehow people with no knowledge of history are survive a, a, a global nuclear war, say, and you have you come out into a new world from yeah, this, and yeah. then eventually they're going to figure out how science, how things work, how nature works, and so yeah. the, and they're going to find evidence in the dirt. The same science will emerge, but it would be different religions. I, no, I don't think so. I, some of them, yes, but not the true religion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, that, that was... <laughs> this one coming in from Harrison Bridges says, Stuart, how old do you think the Earth is? And follow up, do you believe the mitochondria evolved outside of our ancestral cell? Four point six and no. You got uh, it. Uh, roughly four point six for the the best that I know of it. Uh, you know, trusting in experts and yes, because mitochondria started out as a rickettsia bacteria, so it, it precedes ourselves. You got it. This one from Sailman says, "Hey, Aaron, what necklace are you wearing, and do you like Norse mythology?" Yes, I have. I have Norse ancestry, and I am wearing Mjolnir. I've never been Asa True. I have been a, uh, a, a neo-pagan spiritualist at one point. I hung with a lot of Wiccans, but I never identified as Wiccan. I never identified as Asa True. But, and so I, I never had any particular belief in uh, or interest in, sadly, Norse mythology. But I do have the Mjolnir, and I do like my Viking heritage. You got it. With that, I think that's all of the questions. We do want to let our guests go as we're already over time. So we want to say a huge thank you to both Aaron and Stuart. It's been a true pleasure to have you guys here tonight. Thank you.